Hi, I'm Carly of Gnarly Carly Gaming, and today I'm going to be talking about the new 1-4 to four player game from Elk Creek Games. Today I'm going to be talking about Paradox Initiative, now live on Kickstarter. In Paradox Initiative, players take on the role of mad scientists, competing to claim strands of space-time from all across the multiverse. On the multiverse board, you'll find each world, lettered A through O. All of these worlds have a timeline up for grabs. Each world has a corresponding past, present, future, and nexus card. And the more that a player gets of one world set of cards at the end of the game, the more points that they'll earn for that set. Additionally, players are incentivized to acquire cards based on three random research goals that will be revealed at the beginning of each game. Some of these give extra incentive to get cards from a certain time period, like cards from the past, or others will give extra points for acquiring different types of cards, like ones with the icon for alien biology. In this way, most of Paradox Initiative boils down to set collection. However, just how you acquire sets drives most of gameplay. Three main phases define gameplay. You have the wormhole phase, the matrix phase, and the cleanup phase. In the wormhole phase, players will be able to draft timeline cards, as well as acquire technology, special ability cards that assist them or help them break the rules throughout the game. The timeline cards players draft, however, do not score automatically. When drafted, they are placed in a player's console in the designated spot depending on the type of card. Past and Nexus cards will go here when drafted, present and parallel universe cards go here, and future cards go in this last spot. At the end of each round, any unscored cards will move down your console towards the danger track as your last chance to be able to score it before finally being removed from the game. Essentially, drafting a card does not get you the card. Drafting the card starts your timer to get it before it's too late. It's in the second phase of the game, the matrix phase, that players will have a chance to truly claim their cards for scoring later. In the game, each player will have a 5x5 five five grid of particles, known as their matrix. In manipulating this matrix, they will gain the focus that they need in order to claim the strands of time in their cards on their console. What this phase amounts to is playing Candy Crush on your grid in order to save your cards from dying. And if you haven't played Candy Crush, what I mean by that is that each of the tokens you'll be able to move and manipulate and how you do so, you're trying to score combos, which ends up being your focus, which gives you some of the particles off your board in order to claim the cards. During the matrix phase, each player will rotate, taking two actions on their turn. As an action, players can swap any of the particles on their matrix, so long as they have the same symbol on them. Or, alternatively, they can swap one of their tokens in their matrix for one in the center of the multiverse board, known as the anomaly. In this way, they're trying to not get the same symbol in a row, but they're actually trying to get the same color in a row. If they are to get either four or five of the same color in a row, then that row is removed and it scores. If the row has four particles in it, that player gets to keep one of those particles to use, and if it has five, they actually get to keep two. They use these, these particles, to these focus points, uh, to score the cards and claim them from their console. All of the other particles in that time strand scored will be discarded into a personal discard pile and then returned to a shared bag of particles at the end of a round. If a player scores a time strand and collects a particle but still has an action left, they can continue to manipulate their matrix and potentially score even more throughout that turn. Each timeline card has its own needs. Some will specify a certain number or color of particles, and once you've claimed particles, you can put them onto those cards to try to eventually score them. For example, this card only needs one red particle to be scored, and so if I made a time strand of either four or five red particles, I could keep either one or two of those and contribute one of them to this card. Once that is done, it will end up scoring, coming to my pile of cards to be scored. Nexus cards work a bit differently. They don't require particles to score, but instead require you to make a strand with this particular particle in your grid. In this case, 
it wants the particle in the center of the grid to be included in the strand in order for this card to be claimed. But we are mad scientists and we are claiming fragments of space-time. And so naturally, things go a little wrong when we do so. Whenever space-time is claimed, you'll move a glitch marker forward along the planets. If it lands on a planet, that planet is flipped to its fractured side. This is very bad if you're scoring cards for that planet. Throughout the game, you're collecting sets of these planets, these worlds, and should it be fractured at endgame, you actually have to throw out one of the cards for that world prior to scoring it. But all is not lost. Using particles, you can also revive a planet that's already been fractured or purchase a shield token, which will block the glitch token should it land on it, having the shield removed instead of the world fracturing. Shield tokens are great, especially for the worlds that you have the most cards of because it provides a little extra safety net towards endgame. In the last phase of a round, the cleanup phase, every card that was in the wormhole, all the timelines we drafted from the beginning, will clear to a discard pile. But they're not necessarily gone for good. There's key technologies that you can acquire during the drafting phase, and some of them actually allow you to dig through that discard pile again, reviving cards that can be extra helpful for your world set. To add to the coolness and balance of the game, there are some unlettered world cards that give you some special actions such as extra matrix token actions during that phase and really incentivize you saving a world. Saving a world in addition to particles can be how you acquire these cards. So when you already have a world that you care about, this can come in play to give you extra points for doing the thing that you already needed to do. Additionally, there are trigger switches. Anytime you make a strand of a particular color, you can flip its trigger switch. And if you get all three red, blue and yellow trigger switches, then you actually get a wild particle, the purple particle. And that may sound like nonsense, but this is key because sometimes you'll have a matrix and you just won't get the color that you need and purple can pop up to take your place and save the card just before it goes away. It adds a perfect little boost in the game just by doing what you normally would be doing, which is making time strands. All in all, Paradox Initiative is a really cool game of puzzling your way to being a matrix maven all in the name of mad science. And the fact that as you acquire these pieces of time, you have to contend with a multiverse falling apart around you. It's just so thematic, but also adds a very decent, albeit doable challenge to the game. I think it's plays really clean and lovely, and it's a perfect mix of things you can control and things you have to contend with. And it's full of gorgeous art. Elf Creek actually worked with 18 different board game artists in order to bring this game to life. While there's a cohesiveness in terms of formatting, if you look at each of the panoramas that the worlds will make when you collect all of their cards, they're all very unique in flavor, and it's because they all came from different people. And so it's really cool as you try to collect sets to also kind of see the world come alive in front of you. Each world really does have its own character and that's a little small joy that you get while playing the game. My table absolutely adored this game. It's a really great balance of easy to learn, but a lot of crunchy depth and the candy crushing puzzle that you have is just really satisfying and fun to play around with. And so we loved it. I really encourage you guys to check it out. I will provide a link to the Kickstarter below and please let me know if you have any questions in the comments. Other than that, I will see you guys for the next video.